Hello, everybody. It's Professor Kai here. Welcome back to Design for Adoption. This is part three of our uh, three parts virtual talk, and uh, it's a part of the Design for X series of lectures for ENG 1102. So, coming back to the idea for Design for Adoption, we talked about what is innovation, and we talked about why some innovations and some engineering designs doesn't work. That it does. Why are innovations rejected by people or don't get adopted by people, right? So now we're going to ask the question: How do we do design so we can get our designs and get our innovations adopted? And uh, this is we are focused a bit on engineering design, but really everything we talk about is applicable to any kind of design, and. Uh, so we talk a lot about this design thinking perspective here. So we're going to use that perspective to start. If we want, how do we approach the idea of design for adoption? Well, let's start by asking ourselves some questions, right? Can we do it? That's the technological question around feasibility. And then there's the question of should we do it? Well, that's a business viability question as well as an ethical question, right? Should we do something? Should we create something? Is it a good thing to create for people, for myself, for humanity, for the planet, right? And lastly, will people want it? And that's a question around desirability of people. A good innovation, a good design is at the center of all three of these perspectives. And that's when we say yes to all of these questions. So before we get into specifically how to do designs to, for adoption, right? We need to understand who are we designing for? That is, who do we need to convince to adopt our design, right? And, and we need to get really clear on this. And, uh, and convince is not the right word here. Who do we need to share our design with? Who do we need to uh, create value for? So that they would want our design, right? So stakeholders tends to be the catch-all phrase that we use, right? Stakeholder is really pe any people who has a stake in our innovation, in our design. And there are many types of stakeholders uh, that they could be decision makers. Uh, that's people who make key decisions regarding our innovation design. It could be our bosses. Who, and it could also be policymakers who's going to vote yes or no on at whether the type of innovation we create is something society wants or not, right? And uh, and there are other type of decision maker as well. A different type of stakeholder would be customers, right? and this is very typical. And then customers are plainly spoken people who will pay for our innovations and design. Now customers are often users but are not necessarily users. Users are people who will use our innovation design, right? So in the case of a, a phone, for example, typically customer and user are the same, right? On the other hand, uh, let's say uh, if I'm designing a if I'm designing a device for a public library to scam books, Right, so the library is going to be the people that are going to be paying for the device, and uh, the users are actually going to be well, libraries customers. They are the people that goes to the library to borrow books, and they need to scan books barcode. So, and these are just some examples. There are many other types of stakeholders, and uh, what we want is. We need to get to know these people. We need to get to know these people and we need to make our designs valuable to these people, to what they want. Well, that, that's, that's, how, that, that's how we know our design is something that is valuable that's going to get adopted, right? And, and when it, there's a significant misalignment between our design and what well, our stakeholders want, our customers want, our users want, we have a real issue. Right? We have a real issue and then we have to ask ourselves, is this something we want to pursue? Do we want to change the design? How do we make the design better? And uh, well, how do we get to know our stakeholders? There's many ways. We've talked about some in class already. We can, you know, we can do interviews, we can do surveys, we can get to know their perspective that way. We can do personas. You did this in your tutorials, right? And uh, we are going to talk about something that 
It's a different tool. It's a new tool that complements these methods. In fact, on all of these methods, interview surveys and persona actually feed into the methods I'm going to share with. That's called Value Proposition Canvas. The Value Proposition Canvas is a free tool that's developed by Strategizer, and it's 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 a it's a business consulting company, and it's widely used in the lean startup community. Right, and it help us. It's a simple tool to use, and it help us get to know our customers. And uh, really, it's applicable to all stakeholders, not just customers. And uh, it help us design desirable products. So we're, I'm gonna play a video, and let's see if it works here. That uh, it's a three minutes video. Uh, it's a video in video because I'm recording myself in a video that's created by Strategizer to explain the value uh, proposition campus. Canvas. Every day, companies design products and services to improve their customers' lives. But 72% of new product and service innovations fail to deliver on expectations. This means that customers don't care about 7 out of 10 new products introduced to the market. It doesn't have to be this way. Just like you create value for your business with a business model canvas, there is in fact a tool to intentionally visualize, design and test how you create value for customers. It's called the Value Proposition Canvas. The Value Proposition Canvas is composed of two parts, the customer profile and the value map. With the customer profile, you describe the jobs your customers try to get done. Jobs can be functional, like getting from A to B, social, like impressing friends and colleagues, or emotional, like gaining peace of mind. You highlight your customers' pains, which annoy customers while trying to get a job done. Pains are negative outcomes that customers hope to avoid, like dissatisfaction with existing solutions and challenges, frustrations, risks, or obstacles related to performing a job. And you outline customer gains, which describe how customers measure the success of a job well done. Gains are positive outcomes that customers hope to achieve, like concrete results, benefits, and even aspirations. Use the customer profile to visualize, test, and track your understanding of the people or companies you intend to create value for. It's a map that becomes clearer the more you learn about your customers. The second part of the canvas is the value map. With it, you list the products and services your value proposition builds on. You describe in which way these products, services and features are pain relievers, how they eliminate, reduce or minimize pains customers care about, making their life easier. And you outline in which way they are game creators, how they produce, increase or maximize outcomes and benefits that your customers expect, desire or would be surprised by. The value map makes explicit how your products and services relieve pains and create gains. Use it to design, test and iterate your value proposition until you figure out what resonates with customers. You achieve fit by creating a clear connection between what matters to customers and how your products, services and features ease pains and create gains. Great value propositions target essential customer jobs, pains and gains and do so extremely well. Your customer profile may contain countless jobs, pains and gains, but your value map highlights which ones you intend to focus on. But don't forget, an outstanding value proposition can still fail if your business model is flawed. Successful companies embed outstanding value propositions in scalable and profitable business models. Use the value proposition canvas to create products and services that customers want. Get started at strategizer.com. All right, so this is the video by Strategizer, and uh, they do such a good job. I didn't think I should just make my own video, and uh, but I do want to share an example. So here you have an idea of what prop, uh, the value proposition canvas is, right? I'm going to share an example. Hopefully, by going through an example, uh, you get a little clear on how to use this very straightforward tool, right? So an example is about myself, and uh, now uh, many of you have gone to the Design for Humans lecture, and uh, my own student in my section knows this, I like to play piano in class. And uh, my goal is to play piano in class to inspire my engineering students to be more well-rounded. Right? That's my goal, that's my job to do. And uh, but uh, I have a, I have an issue, right? A typical acoustic piano is very very heavy and can be very very pricey. I do not 
want to carry something that big. This is something like 500 kilograms. I don't want to carry half a ton of a piano to lecture hall. That you can that cannot work, right? And it's just too pricey for me. So can we design a product that works for Professor Kai? That's me, right? Speaking in the third person here, a little weird, and uh, that works for me. So we are going to use the value proposition canvas to do this. So to remind you that value proposition canvas has two parts. The customer profile in this particular map is red and uh, the value proposition on the left, uh, left hand side, that's blue. And, uh, and, and we need to, we're going to use both sides. We start with the right hand side. That's the customer profile section, because the first thing we do is we got to understand our customers, right? That's in a sense, that's, there's a parallel between that and we have to do problem formulation first and then do solution formulation. This is, oh, we always want to do that, right? So we, let's get to know our customer first. And uh, for customer profile, we want to make one customer profile for each customer and really it's each stakeholder, right? We can use this for uh, decision makers, for users, for any type of stakeholders. So. But in this case, there is one customer, and uh, and that's Kai, right? Help us understand Professor Kai here. So we don't have to use a circle. So if we see that the customer profile in their mapping is a circle, it's very nice visually. If you have a big uh, piece of paper and you you can you're welcome to do this. Uh, grab two giant pieces of paper and uh, map out the customer profile on one side and value value map on the other side. And if you're in a team, you can put sticky notes, right? That's great. Uh, we can't really do that, or rather it's hard to do on a, on a slide. So I'm gonna use a table, which works just as fine. So the first section is the customer jobs to be done, right? So I have two jobs, Professor Kai, third person here, uh, play piano in class and to be inspirational, right? To be inspiring, to inspire my students to be well-rounded. And, uh, and I have some pains. Uh, I don't like to fiddle with wires. I don't trust that. I don't have time to do it before class. It stressed me out. I don't want to learn a new, new software. I, I am computer scientist, computer engineer, but, uh, but I don't, I, I still don't like to bother with new software because it, it's a large learning curve. I don't want that. And I don't have a lot of money to spend, right? That, that's something making me spend a lot of money that, that's, that's painful. That, that's, that prevents me from doing my job. Some gains that makes my job easy, makes my job do well. Well, uh, this experience, I need it to be similar to playing like acoustic piano because I know how to do that. I don't want to learn a new instrument. Right? It has to be lightweight. I want something lightweight so I can carry to class. And, uh, and just personally, nice looking is really important. I, that's a part of being inspirational for me anyways. Um, aesthetics matter. So that's, that's my profile. I, you know this because you did it because I'm writing it. We know that, right? But, uh, but if you didn't, you're not myself making my own profile. You do interview, you do persona, you do surveys, questionnaires, and you get to know the user however you need to or how, the customer however you need to, right? In the end state, you should know enough to create the customer profile. And when you know that, and we can also always iterate the customer profile, right? And that changes our design as we know more about the customer. Now let's go with this profile. We're gonna, now we understand what Professor Kai, who Professor Kai is and what are my, uh, my pain and pains and gains and my jobs to be done. Let's work on our uh, value proposition on the left-hand side. So depending on our goal, we can actually do one value proposition section, uh, that's the map for all of our product and services, or we can do one value proposition for each of our product and services. We're gonna take the second approach, right? And uh, so we're gonna start with a design idea. So we're gonna do a MIDI keyboard, all right? MIDI keyboard, and I spoke about this in uh, Design for Humans. This idea is, it's, uh, it's a keyboard shape. It sends out MIDI uh, data and the data data stream through a wire connected to computers, and uh, and the computer then use software to create acoustic piano sound. It can sound very good, right? It does require connection to external speakers and connections between uh, the keyboard, possibly between the keyboard and uh, and the computer. The Bluetooth is possible, but Bluetooth definitely doesn't work for uh, for speakers. 
right? There is a delay, and uh, the, and the delay for sound just doesn't work, and that's a technical feasibility issue, right? So now let's map this out. What would this product look like on a value proposition map? Once again, we don't have they use a square shape. We don't have to use that. We can just use a table as well. Right, so product services, we have a MIDI keyboard, that's the, we want to build this, we want to design this. It's going to be affordable, that relieves my pain, and uh, some of my pain anyways, and uh, it has some game crea uh, creators. It plays like acoustic piano, it's lightweight, and is also, MIDI keyboards are very good for music producers, right? Now, that's our value proposition map for the MIDI keyboard. How does our design match with the customer? This is when the tool really becomes alive, right? So now we have on right hand side the uh, the the customer profile. On left hand side, we have the value proposition. Well, how does this work? Oh, I'm doing this. Here, the green things, uh, the green highlights are the alignment, right? So MIDI keyboard is affordable. That aligns. So I don't want to spend a lot of money. It actually, MIDI keyboard allows me to play piano and be inspirational in class. Sure, so I can get the job done, so that's number one, right? So have some pain relievers of not spending a lot of money. It sounds like acoustic piano, and uh, it plays like it's so similar to playing acoustic piano. It's fairly lightweight. There are some disconnects. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the I didn't notice the the uh, animation is going to go this way, but now we know. Uh, so the red is disconnect, right? So it's good for music production, doesn't matter to me. I'm not a music producer, right? So so that's more of a net zero rather than a net negative. It's just not so useful. But here's the thing. I don't like fiddling with wires. This MIDI keyboard requires me to do that. And I, wanna, I don't want to learn new software. This MIDI keyboard would force me to learn new software. Now, these pains are sufficiently important to the customer and uh, that this makes the design not so good. So let's do a slightly improved design, right? Technology is not so different, but we, instead of a MIDI keyboard, we can create a digital piano. Right? By the way, these are actual technology I'm using as examples, right? So a d difference between the MIDI keyboard and, uh, and the digital piano is that, well, we have a standalone piano with speakers. We don't need wires, we don't need software, everything's built in, and uh, it still sounds great, it looks really great, it's lightweight, I can carry it to class, right? When you see me play piano in class, that's what I did. Well. How would this map out, right? So I redid the uh, the the the, the left-hand side, so that's the value proposition side. What's well, affordable? We don't need wire, so that's a new pain reliever, and uh, don't need software. That matches. I don't want to fiddle with wires. I don't want to learn new software. And you see how each of these are matched. So A, affordability here is matched to here. So when you're doing this, you can actually draw out arrows to help yourself think if you you like it that way. I like, I do check marks sometimes, or the green thing is actually serves as a check mark. The idea, regardless, the idea is that we want to create uh, it's much alignment between the left hand side. So that's the value proposition. What is, when we use the term value proposition, it's like really describing how our product and services is valuable to the customer, right? What we propose to be valuable about our product needs to match what our customer wants. That's mapped out by the jobs to be done, the pains and gains. And uh, so this, in this case, is a fairly clear match, right? And now with this, we're pretty confident our product can help Professor Kai. And uh, and when I say practice here, I'm, I'm not referring to play piano. Although that's also true, right? It's that we get you get better at using the value proposition canvas the more you do it, right? So I implore, I encourage, I strongly recommend that you use VPC for your design project. And uh, and the other key here is to iterate. Right. Um, the first time you do it, you're going to discover that your design may not align with the uh, with what your customer wants. 
Now, the, uh, the value proposition campus goes hand in hand with the business model campus, which uh, is a Another tool by Strategizer is also a free tool. It's also very, it's business model canvas. Really, is the the overall cam, canvas that help you design your business. Right, value proposition canvas focus on desirability, and business model campus really focus on viability. Remember, we need to think about both desirability and viability for our product to be uh, adopted. Right. And uh, use together these tools allow you to iterate on your design and business model together to make sure that you can create whether profitable or uh, or viable or effective business and uh, effective product. Right. Uh, there is a three minutes video. I'm only going to play the intro video here. Um, two minutes about business model canvas. Organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels <coughs> describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. Revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver, and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself nor you perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. Now that is a very cinematic um very cinematic video but it's such it's also a very good video to give you an idea of not just what the business model canvas is but also what you need to be thinking about to uh to do to do business now the business model canvas you can learn more about this um from strategizer's video series called from ideas to business i strongly recommend if anyone is entrepreneurial minded, whether now or in the future, go here and learn about it. And uh, it really it's uh, six episodes of three to four uh, minutes videos and they do a great job defining it. And after that, go ahead and just practice it, right? You can even do the business model canvas. You don't need to do this for your design project, but you're very welcome to to actually do one, right? And then just to think about, okay, you have a design here, can this turn into a business? I should also mention uh, uh, there is a not, there's alternative nonprofit version of the business model canvas called the mission model canvas. And it's also by strategizer, you can look it up and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's really for when you're not looking to make profit, but rather you're looking for create, uh, you have a mission and you want to create value that's for social good. And, uh, so this is the end of the three, uh, part video series. And the th third part is a lot longer because we run through an example. So 
I'll do a very quick recap. We talked about what is innovation. Well, innovation is something new that has value to people. It can take many forms, whether it's device, a method, a process, or system, and or maybe something else. And uh, and it might uh, um, actually that slide is also so here. It's something new that has value to people. That's the key, right? So what is innovation? Something new that has value to people, and it can take many forms, as uh, we talked about, right? The second is why we talk about why are some innovations not adopted? Innovation has to be desirable by people and viable from a business perspective for it to to work right and disconnect and resistance can lead to low desirability then people don't actually want to adopt this innovation and uh, and the third part is really about how do we get uh, our innovation adopted we talk about who the importance of knowing who and knowing our stakeholders decision makers customers and users we talked about we, we went through value proposition canvas as a really wonderful tool for us to create alignment between our design and our our customers our users our stakeholders and briefly talked about business model canvas that looked at, at the viability of uh, uh, of business and uh, with all of that uh, we want to come to really the name of this lecture is design for adoption right when we design with adoption in mind it really makes this real that we use technology to serve human needs right and and, and once again i strongly implore you to pra start practicing with your design project that's how you really learn this stuff and uh and with that um well that's the thing just introduce a practice right you're in design project phase two, you're doing uh, solution formulation analysis. This is a good time to actually add value proposition canvas to your design toolbox. You can use it to understand your stakeholders and customers better, and you can use it to align your product design with customers' needs. With that, thank you and uh, for, for listening, for watching, and, uh, and I'll be seeing you in class soon. Take care.